All right, so friends, in this Catechist Toolbox tutorial, we're going to talk a little bit more about the relationship between faith and science, specifically uh, looking at the human person created in the image of God. Uh, this is part two of a two-part series on the relationship between faith and science um, that raises sort of basic questions on the relationship between faith and science that I think are really important for us as parents and catechists to address for the youth and the young adults of our day uh, who are continually bombarded with what science has to say, right? But not always the response that can be given by faith, and not just sort of a, an easy response, but a really intelligent uh, and, and logical response uh, by way of faith-seeking understanding, right? What does Scripture tell us, and what has the church interpreted, or how has the church interpreted Scripture in such a way that we can bring what science has discovered, what science proposes us, into conversation with our faith in a really meaningful way? Uh, if if we don't answer these questions in an intelligent fashion, that's going to make uh, science sort of a barrier to belief for the youth and the young adults of today, rather than um, a tool by which they can explore their faith and bring into conversation with what they know from Scripture and, and what they've been taught about uh, what their Christian faith holds true about our lives all right, and the meaning of our lives. So as with the first Catechist Toolbox uh, tutorial, as with all of them, all the tutorials, the PowerPoint will be made available to you for free for download, uh, to use as you see fit, to edit as you like. And there is also a handout uh, to use for uh, discussing this topic with your students that you can download and use as you like as well. Uh, I, th I always think it's important to get our um, students familiar or our children familiar, as familiar with Scripture as they can be. So that handout is going to ask them to look at Genesis 1 and 2 to read the texts and to ask themselves some questions or to consider some questions as they go through the text and then perhaps you can discuss those questions as a group and see what what uh, folks come up with. Um, as I said in the Catechist Toolbox series on Scripture, it's extremely important that we get Scripture into the hands of of our youth and young adults as much as possible so that they familiarize themselves with it so that they know what's with it and so they can start thinking with it and um, we're going to try and do that today in this Catechist Toolbox tutorial. So just a little bit of a recap uh, from our, first, our part one of this series. There's three points uh, the church asks us to believe with respect to creation. The first is that God created all things from nothing. Creatio ex nihilo. That was a principle that we talked about in more detail in the previous Catechist Toolbox tutorial. The second point is that God cr directly creates every human soul without exception. And that the, the, finally, the third point is that there is a singular origin of the human family. In this Catechist Toolbox tutorial, we're going to focus on the latter two points and unpack them a bit. What does Scripture uh, teach us about those two points? And then how can we bring what Scripture teaches into conversation with science? So, everything that the church teaches about the human creature is anchored in this idea that we find in Genesis 1, that the human creature has been created in the image of God. So there we find... Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So we're going to keep that text in mind 
but there's a text also from Genesis 2 that's central to our discussion, and you see it on the screen there. This is uh, from chapter 2 of Genesis, starting with the latter part of verse 4. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not yet caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth, and the water and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that verse there, 7, is going to be key for our discussion. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Okay, so this is known as the insufflation of Adam. And this is one of the scriptural loci that's used to assert that God directly intervenes in the creation of the human person, regardless of its physical or biological development. Uh, we can talk about that on a sort of grand evolutionary scale, but it also holds true for the creation of every single human person, that God directly creates um, the soul of every single human person, and it bestows upon them great dignity. Okay, so uh, one of the church documents that's pertinent to, pertinent to this discussion is Humani Generis on Human Origin. Uh, it was written by Pope Pius XII in 1950 to address, among other things, the relationship between faith and science, and in particular the theory of evolution. So around this time, right, the theory of evolution is gaining more and more traction, uh, of course, having its its origins in uh, the mind of Charles Darwin, right, his origin of species. Uh, and because it's gaining such popularity and, and science is developing at sort of a rapid pace, beginning to develop at a rapid pace during this time, Pope Pius XII says we need to say something about these topics. And in particular, uh, how are we supposed to think about and deal with uh, the doctrine of evolution? So there you see on the screen in paragraph 36 he writes, for these reasons, the teaching authority of the church does not forbid that in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussions on the part of men experienced in both fields take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution, and as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. Okay. The language that Pope Pius XII is using there is very important, Right? We're going to talk about how we should relate to the doctrine of evolution and, and perhaps use it insofar as it pertains to the origin of the human body, right? coming from pre-existent and living matter. The human soul is a different issue. right? We already saw God directly infuses the human creature with a soul. So then in paragraph 36, uh, Pius XII goes on, For the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. However, this must be done in such a way that the reasons for both opinions, that is, those favorable and those unfavorable to evolution, be weighed and judged with the necessary seriousness, moderation, and measure. Okay, So there's no question God directly creates the human soul. That's asserted and held as an article of faith. Okay? That's the second of those three basic points that the church asks us to hold with respect to creation. Okay, But we can continue talking about the biological development of the human creature right up to this moment when God creates a human soul for the first time. And that's what we're going to talk about here. How could that possibly have happened? Okay, but first let's talk about what Scripture has to say about the human person as the Imago Dei. And if we look at various texts within Scripture... Uh, we sort of get the overall theme or the overall point is made that creation 
tends towards the human person. It seems to be moving in the direction of the human person as the Imago Dei as a sort of culminating point. And that's proximately, right? Not ultimately. Ultimately, all of creation is going to tend towards God, right? And perfect communion with God. But proximately, creation tends towards the Imago Dei, right? So in the Genesis account, God's work of creation culminates in the Imago Dei. After every other day, God said, God sees what he has done and he says it's good. But then the human person comes along at the end of day six. God says it's very good. Right? This culminating work with the Imago Dei sort of puts the cherry on top of the whole thing right? of God's masterpiece. That's that special ingredient uh, that that gives a sort of uh, special quality and conclusion to God's work of creation. Psalm 8 also has some things to tell us about creation's tending toward the Imago Dei and the Imago Dei's unique role there. The psalmist says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Right. So Psalm 8, echoing what God had said about giving dominion to the human person, the Imago Dei, in Genesis, the account of creation in Genesis 1. Right? This special role and care that God gives to the human person. So the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, basing itself on these texts and others, says that the human person is the summit of visible creation, inasmuch as he or she is created in the image and likeness of God. Okay, so creation seems to be tending towards the Imago Dei, if we look at what scripture says, but if we look at it from a scientific perspective, we find that we could assert something very similar. And this is what's known as the anthropic principle. You see a quote on your screen by a Catholic scientist named Kenneth Miller uh, from his book, Finding Darwin's God, a book that I recommend uh, that if you're interested in this topic and want to learn more about the details and, and the complexity of it and how uh, we as Catholics and Catholic thinkers can make sense of it. I recommend that book highly. So this is what uh, Kenneth Miller has to say about the anthropic principle. He says, It almost seems, not to put a too fine an edge on it, that the details of the physical universe have been chosen in such a way as to make life possible. Now look at the language he uses there. Have been chosen. Right? So Miller's working with this idea that what we see here is intentional intentional all right and he says the way that things are put together would seem to suggest that he says recognition of this has led to the formulation of what is known as the anthropic principle the physical constants of the universe in which we live have to be favorable to human life because if they were not nobody would be around to observe them right just a basic common sense point. In other words, the very fact that we are here to make a fuss means that the physical constants of the universe were set up in a way that made our existence possible. So uh, Miller talks about several constants. I think uh, one of the most basic here that we're all very familiar with is the gravitational constant, right? But that plays a role not only in our, our day-to-day existence and our movement uh, about our world, but it has to do with the development of the universe itself and how it grew. So Miller says, the value of the gravitational constants, constant is just right for the existence of life. A little bigger, and the universe would have collapsed before we could evolve. A little smaller, and the planet upon which we stand would never have formed. The gravitational constant has just the right value to permit the evolution of life. And there's other additional just right constants such as the nuclear force and electromagnetism constants right that have to be just right for life as we know it to even exist 
right? So these also uh, tend towards the, or these also suggest that the universe sort of tends towards the development or the evolving of the human person, right? Everything's just right for that to happen. Okay, so let's go back to scripture then. We see that everything tends towards the rise of the Imago Dei, the creation of the Imago Dei is a sort of culminating point theologically, an approximate faction. Um, and that even science would suggest to us that things were moving in a direction that were just right for the development of the human creature. Right? So what is the role of this special creature within creation? Let's go back to scripture, Genesis 1. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. They have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. In Genesis 2, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Okay, so there's two basic roles, we might say, given to the Imago Dei, the human creature, by God. Genesis 1, dominion. And in Genesis 2, they're the role of the gardener or the farmer or the cultivator is given to the human person. Help creation flourish, God is saying, to the human creature. And we should add, you know, there's a lot more that scripture has to say about what it means to be a human uh, creature. Right now in this tutorial, we're just focusing on the relationship between the human creature and the rest of creation. We'll save a sort of more basic and general anthropology for a different catechist toolbox. Okay, so these two roles, all right, dominion and cultivation. We can expand upon those two ideas and find that the Imago Dei has been given these the roles of being a priest and king. So we recall the liturgical nature of Genesis 1 in the Catechist Toolbox on Genesis 1 in Science. That's important here when we think about the human creature's role specifically. Then we look at other places in Scripture and why. how does God call uh, human persons? How does God call the people of Israel, and it's to be a kingdom of priests, right? There you see on your screen a quote from Exodus chapter 19, which is also uh, reiterated in the first epistle of Peter. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, God says, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. If we look at the Old Testament uh, in its entirety and how the people of God, the people of Israel worshiped, it becomes pretty clear that the temple is constructed so as to be garden-like. Such that when we read scripture and we see that, Eden becomes pretty clearly the archetype of the temple. Because we'll see that the temple is adorned with various elements of creation. So the lampstand that's in the temple is a good, is a good example of this. So there you see on your screen uh, text from Genesis, or Exodus excuse me, chapter 25. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. There shall be six branches going out of its size, three branches of the lampstand out of one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with calyx and petals, on one branch and on the other branch as well. On the lampstand itself, there will be four cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with its calyxes and petals. In addition to these lampstands, the pillars of the entrance of the temple were decorated with pomegranates and topped with a lily-like design. So when you were going into the temple, you were to be reminded of Eden, right? of this place of encounter with God and the worship of God. Right? So that reiterates this idea that we talked about last time, that all of creation was really meant to be the church, right? We have a cosmic understanding of what the church is. That creation itself is this body that's meant to give worship to God. And we talked about last time how the human creature plays a role in leading all of creation to the worship of God. Right? So this fits in with the idea of the, of the Imago Dei as king and 
priest of creation. Uh, English theologian and scripture scholar N.T. Wright talks about this in his work, After You Believe. He says, This vocation, too, has its roots in Genesis 1 and 2. If we read those chapters from the point of view of the developed Judaism of the exile and thereafter, then it appears that the role assigned to human in creation was not was seen not only as royal, but also as priestly. Human was simultaneously the bearer of God's wise rule into the world, and also the creature who would bring the loyalty and praise of that creation for its creator into love, speech, and conscious obedience. Right? Love, speech, and conscious obedience. That's going to be important as our conversation develops here. Keep that in mind. The role of language in relationship. The royal and priestly vocation of all human beings, it seems, consists in this. To stand at the interface between God and his creation, bringing God's wise and generous order to the world, and giving articulate voice to creation's glad and grateful praise to its maker. Right. So that idea is similar to what we saw Augustine assert in our Catechist Toolbox uh, tutorial on Genesis 1 and science. When we observe creation and it directs our minds towards God, that in itself is a way that creation gives praise through us. And then we are meant to offer that by bringing order to creation and helping creation flourish. Right? All different ways that this creation becomes a place where God is worshipped. Okay. So the cosmic priest, Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph uh, 358 asserts that creation was indeed created for the Imago Dei. God created everything for man, but man in turn was created to serve and love God and to offer all creation back to Him. Right? That language of offer, language of is language of sacrifice, right? Is language of worship. Right? Creation itself becomes the means by which, if you want that the human person worships God. One of the means. Okay, so the cosmic priest, the human person, most basically the Imago Dei, is meant to offer creation back to God. You see this in Pope Francis' encyclical Laudato Si, where he writes, The ultimate destiny of the universe is in the fullness of God, which has already been attained by the risen Christ, the measure of the maturity of all things. Here we can add yet another argument, for rejecting every tyrannical and irresponsible domination of human beings over other creatures. Okay, so Pope Francis, when he writes that, is keeping in mind arguments uh, by non-believers and even by some believers that say that Genesis 1 is sort of an offensive text somehow. That somehow Genesis 1 has uh, been used and abused to give license to uh, the human creature to abuse creation. And maybe it was used and abused that way by some, but that's definitely not the intent of it. Pope Francis is saying here, no, rather the human creature is meant to care for and guide creation such that it tends toward this ultimate and eternal loving embrace of God. Right? So he continues, right? the ultimate purpose of other creatures is not to be found in us. Rather, all creatures are moving forward with us and through us toward a common point of arrival, which is God. In that transcendent fullness where the risen Christ embraces and illumines all things, human beings endowed with intelligence and love and drawn back, or drawn, excuse me, by the fullness of Christ are called to lead all creation back to their creator. How do they do that? By helping creation flourish, by caring for creation, right? The, when creation flourishes, then we see more of God's beauty radiated by it, right? And therefore, more, creation more easily draws our attention back to God, Right? And we worship God, give praise to God together as one creation. Okay, so how does this creature, as priest and king of the cosmos, if you want, in a very general way, right, come to arrive on the scene, if we think about it then scientifically? Okay, so we need to keep that distinction between body and soul in mind, right? So we talked about how the soul is directly created by God, but there's space now to talk about the development of the body. But then how do those two points converge? Okay, so here I'm drawing from a text by uh, Dominican priest Nicanor Austriaco. 
in his book, co-written with several other Dominican priests to mystic evolution. Another book that I highly recommend if you're interested in this topic. It boils things down to a very basic level that even folks like me can understand from a scientific perspective. Uh, and I think it'd be helpful for you if you're interested in delving deeper into this and even addressing other topics that they include in the text that I won't talk about here uh, when it comes to faith and science. So Austriaco says, from a theological perspective, therefore, biological evolution was a 3.5 billion year process directed by God to advance living matter until it was apt to be informed by a human soul. So God guides this process of evolution right, until what evolves is biologically prepared, biologically in the right place, if you want, to endow a certain creature with a human soul such that it becomes a living being, the Imago Dei. Right? Austriaco focuses on language here. I mentioned language earlier and its importance in relationship and expressing love, right? Language is central to the human person functioning as both king and priest, giving order, being able to think, to order creation, but also to offer that back to God. Why is language so important? Because language is key for relationship, right? And it also makes abstract reasoning possible. You do that through interior dialogue. Yeah. There is some su evidence to suggest that all human language can be traced back to the same origin. All right? We're talking about point two here, the right, direct creation by God of every single human creature, human soul. But this is important, also has important, important implications for the third point, that there's a singular origin of the human family. All right? So that idea that all human language can be traced back to one same origin uh, was put forth by the father of linguist and linguistics, Noam Chomsky. So the development of language is identified with what's known scientifically as the great leap forward. Right? So the evolution of anatomical humans, right? so, so creatures that are physically human-like, Right? That takes place somewhere between 200,000 and 150,000 years ago. However, roughly 75,000 years ago is when we have the first archaeological evidence of linguistic ability, right? the capability for language. And how do we see that in the evidence? We see that in paintings, engravings, in notation, and music. Right? So this evidence comes together, coalesces into what's known as the great leap forward in evolution that sees what... Austriaco is going to identify as evidence of the Imago Dei in, on the stage of creation. Austriaco gets really detailed here, and he focuses on what's known as the FOXP2 gene. Right? So this is an evolutionary mutation. Um, by all accounts, it's a no-no. Right? It's an error, but it's an error that gave rise to linguistic ability. Um, so Austriaco says this, he says, to illustrate this proposal in the context of biological history, consider the evolution of the human gene FOXP2, which has been linked to, our, linked to our ability to speak and to understand language. For the sake of discussion, let us say that the mutation which gave rise to the human gene that facilitated language use in our species occurred when a particular DNA repair molecule in a particular proto-human being who was anatomically human but who did not have the ability to speak repaired a DNA strand damaged by high energy radiation in a particular place and time in Southern Africa. Right? So something goes wrong scientifically right? in a DNA gene, DNA strand, excuse me, and it has to repair itself and this repair leads to a mutation that gives rise to this gene, FOXP2, that gives us the ability to speak. So we track that evolution, and Austriaco says that this correction, this repair, that takes place because God created the human, or created uh, creation to be able to repair itself in just such a way, right? If it acts on its own, right, as God intended it to act, then this takes place as it indeed did. And so Austriaco says that these creatures that 
we're now capable of language with this repair molecule making this uh, correction and giving the rise for language are those creatures that God intended from the beginning to endow with a human soul such that they became the Imago Dei. Right? So the these creatures develop anatomically right, for millions and millions of years and then this mutation happens which God would have known would have taken place from the beginning, and then that, that creature, God endows with the human soul, because now this creature is capable of relationship in a deeper way with not only its creator, but with other creatures, right? Making such a creature right, appropriate to be this kingly and priestly figure within creation, because now this creature has ability for relationship and for abstract thinking, to make sense, to look at creation and say, what's this all about and where is it going? And to offer that back to God as it seeks for answers. Okay, so then point three, the singular origin of the human family. Okay, so Humani Generis, paragraph 27 says this, on the need to hold that, there, that the human family has one origin. When, however, there is a question of another conjectural opinion, namely polygenism, so this idea that humans evolved all over the, the rise of the human creature as we know it, right? Our ancestors evolved all over the globe. No, um, uh, Pope Pius XII says ah, that doesn't work, right? There has to be one origin someplace. When, however, the question of another conjectural opinion, that's polygenism, the children of the church by no means enjoy such liberty. For the faithful cannot embrace that opinion which maintains that either after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take their origin through natural generation from him, as from the first parent of all, or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. Now it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with that which the sources with with that which, excuse me, the sources of revealed truth and the documents of the teaching authority of the church propose with regard to original sin, which proceeds from a sin actually committed by an individual, Adam, and which, through generation, is passed on to all and is in everyone as his own. Okay, so why, then, does the church insist on the singular origin of the human family? Why is that so important? Because of original sin. Okay, so that may seem, at first blush, right, to be a very negative reason. For insisting on the singular origin of the human family. Well, that's kind of a bummer. It's just so that we can all be sinners. Right? That's what it might sound like. But, in reality, that's only one side of a coin. Because it's ultimately about our salvation. Right? If we all fall together, and only if we all fall together, and we are in fact one family, right? Can God, can God send the only begotten Son to save us as one family? Okay, so ultimately this has to do with salvation. Human engineers is articulating it in terms of our fall, in terms of original sin, right, that we inherit from Adam. But ultimately it leads to our salvation. We fall together in Adam. We rise to new life in Christ. Okay, so scripture holds this idea. You see it in 1 Corinthians, written by St. Paul, chapter 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as in Adam, for as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Okay, so that's why. We must hold, the church says, to a singular origin of the human family. But then we have this question of science. Science can ask any question, but it can and, and among those questions can ask is the idea that there was one first couple, one origin of the human family scientifically probable? Is there evidence for that? How do we make sense of that? Okay. Can we harmonize that with science? Again, drawing from the work of Nicanor Ostriaco, we can talk about what's known as the out of Africa hypothesis. Okay, so for a time, archaeological findings seemed to undermine the historicity of Adam and Eve. It seemed to suggest that there was the biological evolution of 
human creatures taking place all over the globe, okay, based on archaeological findings. But by the two th- by 2000, the tens, the first decade after the first decade of the the millennia, right? Science had changed dramatically. Ostriaco says today there is robust evidence from both the fossil record and genetic data that anatomically modern humans, creatures that look like us, evolved in Africa between 200,000 and 150,000 years ago, and that they migrated out of Africa about 60,000 years ago. Recall that this ability for language took place around 75,000 years ago, right? So we have this arise of what looks like uh, a human creature, the capability for language, 75,000 years ago, and then they start moving out from there. Right? They filled the earth, as scripture says, um, about 60,000 years ago, or start filling the earth. Okay? It's important to say here right, that this is what the scientific evidence suggests to us. Now, that could change. Right? So this is how, theologically, we can enter into a dialogue with science where it is right now. If that changes, we can't be so uh, stuck in this idea, this way that we're making sense of everything, that we can't adjust because the science will. Who knows in what direction, right? But this is how we can make sense of it theologically now. And those three points, regardless of what science says, will never change, right? That God creates everything from nothing that God directly creates every human soul, and that the human family has one origin. Okay, so there's various possible scenarios that thinkers have put together uh, for how this took place. How did it all start with uh, creatures Adam and Eve? Okay, So there's three really good ones, and there's a fourth possibility that we can talk about um, based on what scripture says about Adam and Eve and what we saw Ostriaco talk about earlier with the Fox P2 gene. Okay, so the first possible scenario is that God infuses two hominins, that is, biological ancestors, so you can think of like the movie The Crudes, something like that, from the same community, the out of Africa hypothesis, with a rational soul, making them the first images of God on earth, who we know as Adam and Eve. And then the human family grows from there. Okay. Possibility two. God could have infused one hominin with a rational soul who we know as Adam. And then, as Genesis 2 says, created Eve from him. Why not? Right? There's nothing that says that that didn't happen. There's no scientific evidence that says no way. Right? Science can't observe that, quite frankly. So we could say that. There's another possibility here that God infused two homonyms from the same community with a rational soul, Adam and Eve, who have offspring, who then interbreed with non-speaking homonyms like the Crudes, right, who would be biologically compatible at that time. And in this way, the human family grows over time, right? So there is reference uh, to Cain's wife and the early growth of human cities in Genesis 4, verse 18. Where do these other creatures come from? So this would be one way to incorporate what we know scientifically into what scripture says. So it's a little bit broader picture than Ostriaco gives us, and it's given by uh, Kenneth Kemp in his article, or his essay, excuse me, Evolution, Adam, and the Catholic Church. Okay, so those three possibilities, I think, are the best because they're the most aligned with scripture. There's a fourth that Ostriaco gives us the possibility for. He says, God could have infused one hominin, right, biologically uh, human ancestor with the Fox B2 gene, who we know as Adam, and then Adam would interbreed with a non-speaking female, something, you know, biologically like a crude, right? and then some of their children would have been speaking, others not, and then the speaking children would have interbred with one another, growing the human family in that fashion. The problem with this is that we don't have an Adam and Eve, right? So this theory is less satisfactory from a scriptural perspective but it is a possibility as well okay so this is how we can make sense of the evidence that science provides us thinking with scripture right so this is doing theology faith seeking understanding what does scripture reveal to us what is science saying to us at the moment how can we make them talk together to give a really satisfactory explanation for how the human family grew from its one origin 
in Adam and Eve. Okay. So, that's all I have for this time around. Again, the PowerPoint is available for your download. Do with it as you wish. Um, you can maybe split points two and three into separate discussions. That perhaps uh, is a better way to go. And also remember that the handout is also online for you to use with your students as you wish as well. Okay, thanks for your time, everybody.